very fortunate to have as our last speaker of this fall, Dr. Ilana Offenberger, who um, is a professor of Holocaust and history at UMass Dartmouth, which as you may know is a school down the road, right? <laughs> Um, Alana, who spoke two years ago here, and we really appreciate that she's coming here. Again, she has a PhD from the doctoral program at uh, Clark University, which is actually the only school in the country that gives a doctorate in that area. And, um, and she's had extensive uh, experience, uh, both uh, coming out of there, but she was also working at the, worked at the U.S. Holocaust Museum, which is a great place. I'm sure some of you have been there and uh, also for facing history and um, what was the other one? Teach another organization you worked with, but anyway. She'll tell us. Hmm? She'll tell us that, okay. Uh, anyway, so she's had a lot of experience working in, um, in this field and teaching. I know her students love her course. Uh, and. Um, She's done extensive research also in this area, and one of, one of the uh, products of her research is a book that she published last year or two years ago, which is now in paperback, and it's available, it will be available outside for those of you who would like to purchase it. It's a little expensive in hardback, but it's a lot less expensive in, in paper, and she's gonna discount it, right? Okay, so if any of you are interested, this was on um, Jews in Vienna, which is a very interesting topic, but she's gonna be speaking today about uh, the Jewish population in Czechoslovakia, which, and a little more of an upbeat uh, speech. Holocaust is never an upbeat subject, but I think it's a little bit of an upbeat speech, so Alana. All right, hello everyone, and good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for coming out in the freezing cold weather this morning. I am sure that many of you are tempted to stay inside, um, and I'm very happy to see you all here. I'm glad you're here. Um, <clears throat> so today, I am doing a, a presentation on a new subject for me, a new research project. You are going to see some, uh, I think, some fabulous, uh, interesting images on the big overhead. Um, and. Sort of unfortunately, I, I do have to admit that I will be doing a bit of reading. Um, normally when I lecture, I just speak, but uh, today it has to be a little bit more organized for the subject, so I will be doing a bit of reading. Then I will um, be happy to answer all kinds of questions, and then we'll take it, we'll take it from there, okay? So uh, thank you to Ron. Ron just introduced me. I, I wanna tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I've been teaching at UMass Dartmouth in the history department now for um, seven years. I developed over eight courses in the history of the Holocaust, um, related to the Holocaust and Austrian and German studies. Um, and I did my undergraduate research at Skidmore College in New York and in Salzburg, Austria. I did my graduate study at Clark University. I'm happy to be the third graduate from that PhD program. Um, but my greatest accomplishment thus far is the publication of my book, The Jews of Nazi Vienna. And so it's a, a very big privilege for me to be able to now um, have this book available in paperback and at a very reasonable price so that I can um, promote the book and its message far and wide. Uh, so after the talk, which is related, uh, I will be out there and I'll be selling the books. They're $30 or $25, something like that. Um, happy to have the chance to share this work with you. <clears throat> so, um, it's a special pleasure to be here today. It's a nice opportunity to be here with some students and friends and colleagues. And I want to thank, first off, I want to thank Ron Weisberger. Dr. Weisberger has done so much for our local community, for the broader community, 
And I just am so appreciative of the Holocaust and Genocide Center here at Bristol Community College that is bringing these events uh, to us. Uh, the Holocaust Museum comes here, Echoes and Reflections comes here. Uh, we have speakers, renowned speakers, coming to our little area in the south coast. And for me, as a, a, a scholar of the Holocaust, that's very important. So thank you very much to Ron Weisberger. Okay. So my next thank you is to Manya Bark, who unfortunately is not here with us today, but she is the president of the Jewish Federation and she has been a great um, uh, inspiration to me and colleague and helped me out with the project we're doing. Also, Tatiana McCauley is also not here, but she helped me with a lot of the Czech translations. I did manage to learn German in my undergraduate study, but Czech is not one that I have chipped away at yet. Okay, I know how to say I'm hungry like a wolf, and that's it, <laughs> okay? Um, so I wanna thank her, and I also wanna thank someone very special who's here, who is my teaching assistant this semester. His name is Ethan Anderson, and he is a wonderful human being, a upcoming scholar. He is doing impressive work already as my teaching assistant, but also going on to uh, study the LGP LGBTQ uh, experience daily lives during the Holocaust um, for his honors thesis, which he will be doing uh, for me uh, next semester. And he's already working on it, so I'm very proud of him. Okay, and last but not least, I do, uh, I wanna just make a note that I, I thank also my grandmother, Helen, who's obviously not here with me today because she'd be very, very, very old because uh, I'm getting old as well. <laughs> um, but she's with me every day, and she is the inspiration for this talk that I'm about to give. And uh, I just love that doing the research has brought me so much closer to her. And I know that many of us share that same feeling that when we do research into our family history, it brings us closer to those people that meant so much to us. Okay. So without uh, further ado, today I am seeking to introduce you to my new research project, which is on the history and memory of Jewish life in the Czech lands under Nazi occupation. It is a unique story that developed organically over the last 10 years. And it all started with a piece of paper, a one little piece of paper and my own curiosity questions and time to then find the answers. I will begin today with the context. The context is very important. A brief historical overview of the time and place, Czechoslovakia under Nazi occupation during the Second World War. Then I will introduce you to a specific town and to a specific family from that town. And then we will watch the fate of this family unfold during the Holocaust, and you will see the vast scope of such division, so geographically speaking and also metaphorically. And then we will turn to the story at hand, which is the survivors of this family, their return to their hometown, and the surprises that they encountered upon their arrival. Indeed, we will learn that kindness, kindness existed between Jews and non-Jews during the Holocaust, and that some individuals made brave choices not to look the other way, but to take action. So this story is guaranteed to leave you with more questions than answers. Above all, why weren't there more individuals like Joseph Fluma? So the German invasion of Czechoslovakia on the 15th of March, 1939, came as a surprise to the entire Czech population. It brought devastating changes to the livelihood and future of the Czech Jews. Hitler visited the Czech capital on the 16th of March, 1939, to celebrate his success. He stayed in the historic Prague castle overlooking the conquered city 
and he signed the decree to incorporate the historic Czech lands into the Reich under the name of the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. At that time, Nazism set out to destroy Jewish life. Both economically and socially, Jews would be ostracized from the Czech society. Anti-Jewish violence spread throughout the region immediately. The Nazis burned many synagogues. During the first week of the occupation, the Germans arrested 1,000 public persons, including many Jews, in an action called Operation Gitter. Between March 15th and April 15th, while the country was under German military administration, the Germans disseminated anti-Semitic propaganda through the radio and newspapers. In some towns, such propaganda was not necessary. Czech fascist groups organized violent demonstrations, damaging synagogues, dragging Jews out of cafes to beat them on the streets. To my students who have listened to the study of Nazi Austria a year prior, this violence sounds quite familiar. <clears throat> The Czech fascists and the National Socialist Czech workers supported Nazi anti-Jewish policy and pushed for further persecution of the Jews. Implementation of Jewish restrictions, enforcement of the Nuremberg laws, and ghettoization. A special section of stormtroopers advanced this agenda and assaulted Jews in main cities such as Pilsen, Pribam, and Dobris. By the summer of 1939, German policy legally enforced the identification, separation, and expropriation of Jews. On 21 June 1939, a law passed Aryanizing all Jew Jewish property. By July 1939, the Nuremberg laws went into effect throughout the Czech lands. Thereafter, all Jews were registered and their ration books were stamped with a J. Jews also had an 8 p.m. curfew. They could not travel by rail without Gestapo permission, nor could they visit the parks, museums, theaters, or libraries. <clears throat> so 118,000 Jews in the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, this is the number that we're starting off with. Um, and this is your uh, region here. <clears throat> By the summer of 1939, there are 136 Jewish communities throughout the Czech lands, composed of some 118,310 persons. They received permission only to operate under the direct administration of Nazi Germany. On the 15th of July, a central office for emigration was opened in Prague. It was modeled after Adolf Eichmann's Central Office for Jewish Immigration, which had been offer operating successfully in Vienna since a year prior in August 1938. This office, initially focused on emigration, ultimately it was established to secure control over Jews, to enforce the complete de-Judaization, de-Judaization, Okay, or de-Jewification, the elimination of Jews from the land. The office was opened next to the offices of the secret security police and the criminal police forces. It was directed by Hans Gunther, Eichmann's deputy. From the time of its inception, Jews from these 136 different religious communities representing different levels of religious observance they were forced to work for and report to this one office. By 1940, approximately 27,000 Jews managed to emigrate from the Reich and escape Nazism due to the efforts of this office. However, as time went on, the focus of the Jewish community became less and less about emigration and more about providing aid for the needy collecting taxes and fees, gathering data, implementing orders for forced labor, 
and eventually assisting deportees. The Jewish communities set up public kitchens, old age homes, children's homes, hospitals, and orphanages. On April 30th, 1940, Jews were ordered to register and subsequently sell all of their gold, all of their platinum, silver, precious stones, and pearls to a special purchasing agency. And they had to deposit all of their stocks, bonds, and securities to a foreign currency bank. Soon after, Jewish bank accounts were blocked and Jews could only withdraw small amounts. The Nazis then transferred a huge quantity of confiscated valuables to the Reich Treasury. <clears throat> By October of 1941, the German Reich prohibited all Jewish emigration. The final solution to the Jewish problem shifted from expulsion to annihilation. Accordingly, the Central Office for Emigration in Prague is renamed, quote, the Central Office for the Solution of the Jewish Problem in Bohemia and Moravia. In 1942, August, the purpose of this office was to facilitate the deportation of the Jews, the Czech Jews. At the peak of Nazi terror, the Germans employed new measures to eradicate Jewish life. By spring 1942, an entire concentration camp network spanned the German-occupied territories. This included thousands of labor camps, transfer camps, holding camps, concentration camps, and sub-camps. Six death camps also operated on Polish soil, including Chelmno, Treblinka, Sobibor, Majdanek, Belchek, and Auschwitz. Jews from all over Europe would be deported to these camps via railway. In the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, the Germans had alternate plans. In November of 1941, a small city northwest of Prague was transformed into a holding camp where Jews would be temporarily resettled and await their transport to the east. Terezin, or Theresienstadt, was a small garrison city Emperor Joseph II had built for his mother Maria Theresia in the late 18th century. Under the Nazis, Theresienstadt would become a symbol for the final solution on Czech soil. Over 155,000 Jews from Germany, Austria, the Czech lands, and from throughout the Netherlands passed through Theresienstadt, and more than 80% of them perished. <clears throat> And this is an image <clears throat> um, from a small Czech town of Jews being deported to Theresienstadt. <clears throat> the deportation of Czech Jews was launched on the 27th of December 1941. It targeted 88,000 Jews, approximately, remaining in the protectorate. On 24 November, the mass transports began heading to Terezin. Each week, transports left from large cities such as Prague, Pilsen, and Brno. On the 27th of March, the transports of Jews from the provinces began. In total, 122 trains traveled through the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, transferring 73,608 people to Terezin between 24 November 1941 and 16 March 1945. From Terezin, Jews were sent to the death camp Treblinka, where over 800,000 Jews were murdered in less than a year, and also to Auschwitz, among other destinations for murder. <clears throat> Here we see just a general overview of the statistics that I tried to uh, break down to help keep our context intact. So we start with about 120,000 Jews in the protectorate in March 1939 with the German invasion. 
approximately 27,000 managed to emigrate through this central office, and then you have approximately 80,000 that are deported to Terezin and onward. These numbers are all they are all very problematic, as, as I found with all the numbers that I have done research on through all of my study. Um, yes, there are, are conclusions as to why these numbers come to be, but I don't think that they can be relied on 100%, which is why I often round up or round down or estimate. And I think also it's quite important that we understand that the numbers are a reflection of the individuals. So whether we have 82,309 or 80,000 or 85,000. The idea is the vast scope of life that was taken. Um, and so now with this background, I'm going to introduce you to one specific town, one specific family, and, uh, and, and its trajectory. Um, this specific small town in the Czech lands has a very rich Jewish history. And like the other Jewish communities afflicted by the Holocaust, we see a family that is divided among multiple fates. We see morsels of history that were all but extinguished. Um, they waited to be pieced together by the right hands, which I hope mine are. <clears throat> so with that introduction, I now uh, bring us to the part of the presentation that I find uh, most interesting. And um, certainly all of the, the numbers and data that I have just given you is a very brief overview. Um, there's plenty more research to be done, and there are plenty of books I can refer you to, and I have an article coming out on this topic that I'd be happy to let you know about as well. But now we turn to our little town, which is Velki Mezerici. And um, this is a small town in southern Moravia, which is rich in Jewish history. It is a small town situated in the hills of southern Moravia. It is 135 kilometers southeast of Prague and 48 kilometers west-northwest of Brno. So you know these two um, pretty big cities. The total current population is approximately 11,000 persons. Is approximately 11,000 persons. Um, the town once had two functioning synagogues. The small 17th century Gothic Renaissance old synagogue and the new synagogue built by the Viennese architect Augustine Propop in the 19th century neo-Gothic style. The first Jewish families settled in Velki Mezerici even earlier than the synagogues were built in the mid-1500s. The first mentions of Jews come from 1497 and 1518. In the Jewish cemetery, which sits high on a hill above the river Oslava, tombstones date back to 1677. <clears throat> These are a couple images of this very uh, magical looking place. The former Jewish street, a former synagogue, <clears throat> the gate of the cemetery, and this former uh, the Jewish cemetery, the Jewish cemetery established in 1650. So this cemetery was established in 1650 when Jews purchased 4,500 square meters for 60 guilders to use as a burial ground. Over 200 years later, in 1880, a beautiful ceremonial hall was built in the neo-Romanesque style near the entrance of the cemetery. And that is what you see there. And that would be my mother. She's not here with us today, but she's thinking of us. And that's her walking in front. <clears throat> um, today, the walled cemetery holds more than 1,300 tombstones, bearing witness to the fact that many Jews lived in Velki Mezerici between the 17th and 20th centuries. 
In fact, Jews accounted for almost one third of the total population throughout the 18th century. Uh, 88, 888 persons were Jewish in 1790, and by the mid-19th century, the Jewish population reached its peak with over 1,000 persons um, as Jewish in 1857. Over the next 100 years, however, this number would drastically decline due to pogroms and due to war. By the 1930s, Fewer than 100 Jews remained. That's a very small number. Um, and during the Nazi occupation, of course, the final members of this Jewish community were deported. Today, there are no Jews living in Velki Meserici. However, the Jewish history has not completely disappeared from this Czech town. <clears throat> So again, I'll just show you, these are, this is the former Jewish street, the Dal Dalimilova street, um, and you can see it running through there. Um, these, some of these pictures are pictures that I took myself and others are from the internet. So these are internet pictures, and this is my picture. Um, this is the synagogue, the cemetery, the Jewish cemetery. These are my pictures from walking around through this cemetery. <clears throat> and um, here we are uh, in the cemetery. <clears throat> okay. So in 1996, and now we transition a little bit. Um, in 1996, uh, Helen Offenberger, my grandmother, she passed away in uh, Canandaigua, New York, and she left behind a green box full of letters written in German, in Czech, and in English. It was almost 10 years later, after I had defined myself as a Holocaust historian, that I started looking carefully through the letters in this box. Piece by piece, over the next decades, I put the almost forgotten history of her family and of this little Czech town back together. And I uncovered a tragic tale that also contained some surprises and some glimpses of hope, which I think might be useful for us in today's world. <clears throat> so this is one of the pictures from that green box um, that I had no idea initially who it was or what it was. And uh, now, about 10 years later or 20 years later, uh, I know who it was. This is Jakob Mueller. <clears throat> so, my grandmother Helen was the granddaughter of Leocadia and Jakob Mueller of Velki Meserici. She spent her childhood summers visiting with them and spending time in that beautiful countryside with her aunts and uncles and cousins. Her grandparents, Jakob, born in 1842, and Leocadi, born in 1850, were deeply rooted in the town of Velki Meserici. They were active members of the vibrant Czech Jewish community during its mid-19th century heyday. Indeed, Jakob Mueller was the head of the Jewish community for over four decades. He also owned a distillery in the castle district of the town. Additionally, he bought and sold real estate, leaving his last two houses and the distillery to his wife, Leocadi, upon his early death in 1912. So he died before both wars. <clears throat> the couple had six children, four boys and two girls, Ferdinand, Alfred, Irma, Egon, Paula, and Lev. The daughters, Irma and Paula, both married and started large families of their own. Irma married Adolf Nash and had three children, Eric, Wilhelm, and Trude. Paula married Ignac Pisker and had Fritzi, Helen, my grandmother, and Heinz. Less is known about the lives of Ferdinand and Egon, while it appears that the other two boys, Alfred and Lev, did not survive long after childbirth. Today, the graves of Jakob and Leocadia Mueller stand tall in the Velki Meserici Cemetery. 
Below Jacob's name is a tribute to his service as the head of the Jewish community. And he is remembered as unforgettable and irreplaceable. Okay. Um, the, he was the head of the Jewish community for some four decades. And the beautiful inscriptions and the ornate tombstones bear witness to the complete lives that they lived, the proper Jewish burial they received, and the large Jewish family that they gave life to in the town of Velki Mezerici in the decades before the Holocaust. Both Jacob and Leocadi died before the German occupation in 1939. However, their children and grandchildren could not be spared the Nazi onslaught. So this um, gravestone that you see here, when I came across the gravestone, this is a picture I took uh, two years ago when I was in um, this town doing this research. I did not know at the time when I took the picture that I had found the gravestone of my great 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 grandmother and grandfather this is something i pieced together yet after afterwards so on the top at these times people were both put on the same on the same stone so on the bottom it's very easy to make out the leocadi mullerova that's just the czech the way of the, the the female name has an ova and above it you can see Mueller way up high and then there's this inscription about his years of decade decades and he says unforgettable and irreplaceable on the tombstone and that's that kind of interesting okay so <clears throat> do a couple pictures at a time. Okay, so one family, multiple fates. The example of a divided family. The four Mueller siblings, Ferdinand, Egon, Irma, and Paula, together with their extended families, met drastically different fates under Nazi occupation. While both brothers managed to flee the German Reich before the war, they proved unable to aid their sisters, brother-in-laws, nor their nephews or their nieces. Ferdinand, who had become very well known as a gynecologist in Vienna, he fled to Shanghai, where he lived out the war, only to die from cancer in 1945. Egon, fled, Egon managed to flee to Paris. He avoided deportation and survived the war. Irma was not so fortunate. She was deported with her whole family, her daughter Trude, her son Wilhelm, her son Eric, her daughter-in-law Esther, to Terezin in 1942. From Terezin, the family, including her grandson Michael, who was born in Terezin, was deported to Auschwitz. All were murdered upon arrival, except for Eric, her middle child. He miraculously survived outliving a death march from Poland to the German interior in 1945. And in May of that year, he was liberated by the Americans in Dachau. <clears throat> so Paula, the other sister, Paula Pisker, shared a similarly tragic fate. And these images are of her immediate family and None of them, except for the first woman that you see, which is my grandmother, none of them survived. So all of these pictures, again, came out of this green box, and I didn't have any of the names or understand who they were um, because I wasn't able to ask. I didn't look at the box until after she died. So um, <clears throat> with the research, I was able to then piece together who is who. Um, and this large family, here we see uh, my grandmother Helen with her sister and her nephew and the husband, um, her mother, her nephew. And here's a large family picture. <clears throat> so uh, as far as the fate of Paula, um, for five months, Velki Mezzarici, remained free from Nazi control and provided as a refuge for Paula, Ignac, Heinz, all these people are pictured here above, 
In addition to the tiny community of the hundred Jews that were remaining um, in Velki Mezzarici. But still they were not spared. Paula and Ignac were deported from Terezin to um, Treblinka. And Paula's eldest daughter was deported with her little son, George, who was then three years old, from Brno to Terezin. And from there, they were transferred from, to Auschwitz and murdered. Um, her middle daughter, Helen, my grandmother, immigrated to the United States. Her youngest child, Heinz, also pictured above with the ball. Um, he uh, was sent to Lipa then to Terezin, then to Auschwitz, and then to Gleiwitz, a subcamp of Auschwitz, where he was claimed to have been shot in 1945. So Helen was the only one to survive. <clears throat> the dispersal and destruction of the Mueller family, taken together with the innumerable family histories of all the Jews lost from the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, including those from Velki Mezzarici, seemed to bring a tragic end to centuries of progressive Jewish life in the Czech lands. <clears throat> so this chart I put together just sort of shows the different ways that this particular family went. <clears throat> we have the names of the different camps from Terezin or Talipa, Treblinka, Auschwitz, Gleiwitz, Dachau. Um, the, the map in the middle is a map that shows the death camps. Uh, we also see Shanghai, Paris, and New York. Those are just a few of the cities that happen to relate to this particular city, this, excuse me, this particular family. So this chart shows you one particular family's trajectory. Everyone within that family went to all of these different places. The green places are safety. Shanghai, Paris, New York. And the blue places are places that people went and 90% perished. <clears throat> so you can see, and then you can multiply this as we go back to the initial slides and think about the larger numbers of some 80,000 persons and their families affected by the Holocaust and the Nazi takeover. <clears throat> So now we see another piece. <clears throat> Helen was the first member of the Mueller family to reach the United States in 1938, and she left before the German occupation of the Sudetenland. She took a great risk leaving her family behind, not knowing what the future would hold. It would almost be a decade before she learned of their tragic fate predominantly due to the efforts of her one cousin, Eric, who survived. Like many individuals tormented by the aftermath of the Holocaust, Helen never talked about her past. She never told me about this Mueller family. She never showed me her family letters, but she safely and carefully preserved them in a dark green box for almost six decades. Why had she kept them for so long and never told anyone about them. In reading these letters and looking at the pictures, one comes to recognize that the letters as the final words of her loved ones are almost too painful to read and yet too precious to discard. <clears throat> so dozens of letters in German, in Czech, and in English passed between the descendants of this Mueller family over a span of 10 years. The descendants meaning my grandmother and her one cousin who survived. <clears throat> and these are, some of the, these are some of these letters. <clears throat> In addition to their post-war correspondence, the letter collection included in both handwriting and in type, as you can see, picture postcards, letters, and drawings from Helen's parents, her sister, her nephew, her aunts, her cousins, her friends, all of them trapped in Nazi-occupied Bohemia and Moravia. Letters with the return address, 34 Damiljova Street, Gross Messernich, which was the German name for Velki Mezzarici. 
the final letters date to 1941, and then the communication stops. <clears throat> So I scanned a number of the letters. You can see here the different handwriting. So there, yes, you can't read what they say. Some of the letters, I can't read what they say because they're in Czech. But you can still make out a lot from looking at these letters. You see that they're in different handwriting. They're different times. They're from different um, people. Sometimes two people write on one letter. <coughs> and sometimes you have um, printed letters. And reading from uh, sometimes you have letters from the ships, which is clear. Clear. There's a ship on the front of this one. This was uh, when her cousin was coming to America. <coughs> and then postcards. And then this one, which is particularly striking, I think, um, because you can see the writing of a child at the bottom of this. And um, a large, large number of a lot of somethings, which I would imagine are kisses, right? Because that's how we usually sign off our letters. And so it's sort of this universal language that makes this child one. Again, this is one story of one family. And there were so, so, so many. <clears throat> so uh, the final letter is dated to 1941. Then the communication stops. Helen never heard from them again. She endured almost three years of silence, wondering and waiting to hear what had happened. How precious the moment must have been when she found her one cousin Eric's name on a list of survivors in 1945. After 1945, she would begin corresponding with him bi-weekly. She would plan and coordinate his arrival to the United States and would learn from him the horrific fate of her family. <clears throat> okay. So here he is, this cousin that I've been talking about. This is the one survivor from that large Mueller family. Um, she went to the United States and he went through the camp system, survived the death march. And here he is, his name is Dr. Eric Nash. I also had the chance of meeting him. I did not know about these things, this part of his life when I met him, or I would have been able to ask him some questions about it. <clears throat> okay, so we continue uh, now. How's everybody doing? Am I keeping everyone's attention? I know it's a long, it's a long story. It's my first time telling this particular history. Uh, so we'll, we can wrap it, make it shorter next time if need be. My TA will tell me for sure. OK, so the next part here. In this green unraveling box, we come across one special document. Among the many documents, there's this one piece of paper, and it stood out from all the rest. And it begged my close attention and further scrutiny. Do we want to see it? Sure. Yes. OK, here it is. <clears throat> The paper was different, right? It's different than all of those other letters that you saw. I, what is this? What is this, I thought. And I was actually, I remember being in Vienna doing research for my, for, for my PhD, working on the Viennese Jews and thinking about this document and um, having my, calling my mom, having her send me something. This was in 2007 that I was wondering about that document that I had seen. <clears throat> so. Why was it so different? Well, it's a list. First of all, it's a list. So a list of what, right? And then um, it's on a stationery, decorated with vines and with flowers. And it's got this blue ink. And next to it is this family name, Fluma. And then the town, uh, Velki Mezrici. But I didn't know it was a town. I didn't know any of this stuff. I just, OK. So I. I'm in Vienna, I remember that. I'm getting out my the computer. I start Googling Fluma, Velki Mezzarici. I find out Velki Mezzarici is this little town. And then Fluma. Oh, there seems to be a Fluma in this little town with a phone number on the internet right now. <clears throat> so beneath this letterhead is the also the maiden name of my grandmother. And I wanted to know, you know, what is what is this list? Who are they? Who are the Flumas? 
after the preliminary research, I came to find that this was in fact a list of possessions belonging to Helen's parents uh, from the Mueller family. And then I dug further into the letters and the post-war correspondence with her cousin Eric following his liberation, and I found out more. <clears throat> so the letters revealed that after the war, Eric made a concerted effort to return to this little town of Velki Mazarici, where his grandparents were too, and retrieve any family heirlooms in order to bring them home to Helen in the United States. On October 11th of 1945, Eric typed a letter to Helen. He detailed a difficult process that lay ahead. Quote, I started caring for your properties. It is very, very complicated, but I'm sure it will come through. You have to send me an authorization that you, as the only heiress, give me the authority to take care of your things. Send it as soon as possible, because every day means a loss and a danger that things will disappear. Send, please, another authority addressed to Mr. Fluma in Velki Mezzarici. He took over the things to hide for your parents. So as the letter continued, Eric's optimistic tune, tune changed. He began to, to express a deep skepticism. Quote, these people have only one hope, that no Jews may return. They are not willing to return things which they hide. Despite this warning, Helen moved forward with the process, sending the authorizations, and Eric carried out his promise to return to that little town of their grandparents and meet with the Flumas. To their surprise, some four months later, on the 8th of February, 1946, Eric wrote to Helen, quote, the Fluma folk has been very sweet to me. She issued me some things and sent a list of them to you. In a typed letter he sent to Helen on the 13th of March, 1946, he documented receipt of many items which matched the original list. In addition, he described a number of precious items returned to him that were not on the list. One brooch, square, platinum, with a diamond in the center, very nice. One brooch with ornaments, no stones. Two very nice rings, one with three stones, one with five stones. Four various golden chains. <clears throat> and I will take the, I, I just put this together at this moment, but I, I do always wear this, this chain that is from my grandmother that she told me was from her grandfather. And I never really made that connection until right at this moment, but I'm pretty sure this is the chain that she didn't take with her to America, but that she got back from this list. <clears throat> These return possessions, together with the letters in the dark green box, remain as the last tangible pieces of the Pisker and the, the Mueller family history from Velki Mezzarici. And in this sense, they are uh, invaluable. Um, and I'll just tell you some of the things on this list. Okay, you see them above here. I translated this. Um, <clears throat> there were English banknotes, gold money, 10 gram, 35 pieces of gold money, 10 grams of silver money, four gold watches, one, cur one Persian carpet, six gold utensils, six small silverware sets, five silver salt shakers, a box of various glass and porcelain, three men's shirts, 27, uh, sorry, seven women's shirts, 14 pillows, 16 pillow covers, four tablecloths, 11 quilt covers, three men's uh, nightgowns, two nightgowns, 65 tea towels, 48 towels, 82 napkins, one winter coat, two men's suits, a summer suit, a passbook for 20 check crowns. That's a lot of stuff for one person to hold on to for somebody else. Okay. <clears throat> so, 
The items on this list reveal another layer of the history. They testify to the courageous and kind individuals who honored their neighbors despite the possibility of Nazi reprisals. Many of the items belonging to Helen's family were valuables that the German government ordered Jews to hand over prior to deportation. On the 30th of April 1940, the decree demanded that Jews register and sell all gold, platinum, silver, and precious stones, and that they deposit all stocks, bonds, and securities. The list on the family Fluma stationery suggests that the Piskers entrusted gold coins, silver coins, check crowns, and English banknotes to their neighbors. In addition to the list of returned items documented in, by Eric in 1946, they must have given for safekeeping precious stones and brooches, rings, pearls, gold chains, etc. The Nazis strictly prohibited Jews from keeping these items. They intended them to land in Nazi hands. <clears throat> so now the question is a question of agency. And why would an ordinary Czech citizen risk his life to safeguard these belongings. So here is Mr. Joseph Fluma. And you see his name on the top of the stationery here, the top hand corner of the stationery, Joseph Fluma under the flower. And here he is, a gardener. <coughs> So why did Joseph Fluma, an ordinary Czech citizen, risk his life to safeguard these belongings? As the overseer, he put his life and the life of his family, possibly even the town, at great risk. Not only did he hide valuable items, he hid bulky possessions that required space. A box of glass and porcelain, men's and women's suits, pants, nightgowns, linens, a large quantity of linens, pillows, quilts, towels, tablecloths. Napkins, Eric exclaimed in to, uh, napkins, Eric exclaimed to his cousin in March of 1946. Quote, what for God's sake shall I do with the hundreds of table napkins? Mm -hmm. He went on to note, I can't believe even our grandmother wore such nightgowns. Alas, there were 82 napkins, 65 tea towels, and 48 regular towels. How did Joseph Fluma manage to hide all these items on behalf of his neighbors? Why did he do it? Unfortunately, the answer is unclear, yet still unraveling with further research. Perhaps he hid them in deference to an old relationship between the family and the Mueller's. Perhaps it was due in part to his profession. As the owner of a large gardening outlet, which provided flower bouquets and wreaths, fruit trees and potted plants, cut flowers, floral decorations for events of all kinds, and plant food for vegetables and flowers, did he have adequate physical space to keep the possessions well hidden? Did he bury them among the gardening supplies? In one of Eric's notes to Helen regarding the condition of the returned objects, he documented that there were four, four gold watches given to him, but they were ruined during to burial, due, due to burial. On the 8th of February, 1946, he lamented, quote, the silver knives, forks, and spoons are either gone or spoiled by the humidity. They were digged into the earth for many years. Whether in perfect shape or ruined from neglect, these possessions were invaluable to Helen. The returned items belonging to her murdered family held enormous meaning. The 82 napkins were not just napkins. They were family heirlooms, likely passed down over generations from the original Mueller family that had lived and prospered as Jews in the little Czech town of Velky Mezerici for generations. These memories of Jewish life that was lived before the Nazi onslaught were preserved due to the decisions of a single man. <clears throat> 
So little is known about Joseph Fluma and his decision to save the items belonging to his Jewish neighbors. However, his decision to return them after the war was honorable and outstanding, as it was not the norm. Far too many, far too many survivors returned home to find a door slammed in their face and to hear the words, this is my home now. It was not common for persons to return valuables to Jews after the war. It was the exception. Joseph Fluma helped to preserve the history of a family and saved a fragment of what was lost. In doing so, he not only preserved the physical objects, but the belief that humanity can exist even in times of great evil. Joseph Fluma therefore surfaces as a righteous individual, as an upstander who acted with agency instead of looking the other way. <clears throat> so, Velki Mezrici, 2017, and you see a large billboard. And on that billboard, Fluma. <clears throat> In 2017, I traveled to Velki Mezzarici to meet with the children and grandchildren of Joseph Fluma. I was welcomed with great hospitality into their home, which still stands on the very same grounds as it did nearly a century ago. Indeed, the Fluma family continues to run and operate a very successful gardening enterprise on the same property, just as they had generations ago when the town was filled with a thriving Jewish community that included the Mullers. If we look further into this relationship between the Mueller and Flumas, we uncover questions about the larger history of the friendships that existed between ordinary Czech citizens and Jews throughout the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. How common is this story and how important is it to be told? Although Jews no longer live in Velki Mezzarici, because of individuals like Joseph Fluma and his descendants, the memory of the Jewish com community remains. Today, it is possible to go to Velki Mezzarici and to visit the synagogue, a Jewish museum, and a Jewish cemetery. Throughout the Czech lands, Jewish prayer houses and memorial sites remain, even where Jews do not. While it is imperative pre to preserve Jewish historical sites because they preserve public memory and consciousness, is it not also imperative to tell the private and personal stories of the individuals that made this possible. When all the survivors are gone, only the memorials, museums, precious artifacts, and personal histories will remain. Upstanding Czech individuals like Joseph Fluma helped to ensure that Jewish history would live on long after their time. I propose that individuals who acted with agency demand our close attention and praise especially in the fragile world that we live in today. Thank you. Thank you. That was a real, real applause. Thank you so much. I hope it wasn't too long and I, I am happy though, I'm happy to take I'm um, happy to take questions. Yes, you're my favorite, one of my favorites. <laughs> so, great detective story. Thank you. Um, among other things. So, did, did the family, did the Fluma family have no inkling or information that, okay. that you might at least, you know, <clears throat> extrapolate what might have been? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I'll go back here. To this. So this is the son of Joseph Fluma. Um, he's in the red shirt. His wife, that, then that's myself. Um, and then his wife is in, the red, is in the black shirt in the middle. That's my mom, my research assistant for this, this trip. 
Hi, mom, if you watch this. Um, and then next to them, next to, to my mom, is the daughter, uh, Veronica. And she was the one who I really had the most contact with because she was the only one that really spoke English. Um, so first off, we had a, we had um, my colleague and former professor, Tatiana McCauley, Dr. McCauley, who is, uh, speaks Czech, she reached out to the family. She mentioned to them the name Mueller. She mentioned to them the project. They wanted to meet me. That's the first sign that, that they might have known something. Because if they didn't know anything, most likely they're not wanting a historian doing research on the Holocaust to come meet with them. Um, so they met with us, and then uh, I do know that these pictures, so this picture, these two pictures are from them. Mm -hmm. They offered to show me pictures of the grandfather. Um, and they said a little, uh, they mentioned they heard that maybe he did some, some of this stuff. But they didn't tell me very much. They just said that they were aware that he might have helped some people. And then at one point, actually, um, the mother ran off and then she came back with a photograph and she said like is this your uh your great uncle or whatever and i said no it's not which which suggests that it was somebody else that was somehow related to maybe uh, that he had helped um my the the daughter she uh <clears throat> sorry here we go she was in um, doing a master's degree in in Brno, and um, she was spoke a bit of English, and she was very interested. To her, this was the first time that she was really. She said she'd heard a little bit, but not much, you know. And so she was very interested that my grandfather might have been an upstanding individual. So, um, but but no, they didn't they didn't they didn't give me a lot. They just gave me a, a little, a little, which I guess is part of the keeps the. Detective work going, yes, as you said. Other questions? Tom. How old was Helen when she came to the country? Why did she choose the States? Ah, more good questions that I don't have. I don't have all the answers to that, but um, she was married. I believe that she was born in 1910 or 12. Um, so she was, she was in her late 20s, and she was married, and um, all I know is that she said to me that it was sort of a mistake. You know, she couldn't imagine that, uh, she didn't, she didn't never talk to me about it. She never talked about coming here. She just talked about that uh, she was young and defied her father and left with her husband, and that was sort of a mistake afterwards. Which is interesting to be, um, you know, to survive and consider it a mistake. Um, these are things that are, are sort of outside of our realm of, under, of understanding. And with my students, we talk about them as choiceless choices. So, I mean, to survive and to lose your entire family, that's, in a sense, a, a, a choice. Obviously, she didn't know what was going to happen when she left. I'm sure that they were happy that she survived, but it's a very difficult uh, and complex situation to understand. And again, what's so important is that this is not the story, just the story of my grandmother, right? I mean, it's the story. It comes to me because it's the story of my grandmother, but it's the story of all, like all of our, all of our. Um, relatives and, and of so many people that went through this. So it's just how um, we relate to it and understand it. <clears throat> Thank you. I hope that answered a little bit. Yes. Thank you for coming. Yes. Has there been any further um, acknowledgement of Lula by other than yourself, of course? Not that I know of. No. Nothing that I know of yet. And I, um, again, this is just the tip of this research. So it started, you know, with the, with the box and the letters. Uh, my, uh, my, that book is done now, so um, this is going to be the next book project that I'm working on. It's an article now, and it's gonna, I'm hoping to continue, to continue to do research, specifically to go back to this area and to look and see. Um, it's also a very delicate subject, since it is such a small town, to know how, I mean, I don't know exactly how much 
They want to be publicized. There may be others that did that. Yes, for sure. Yeah, there, in, that, in that area. Right, in, the, in that area there might have been others. And um, yes, it's very, it's very interesting. It also has to do with, uh, with the p political climate in the places at the time, whether they want to be known or not known. So, um, you know, out of, yeah. It's, it's, still, it's still a very f sort of a fine line, but I, uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Other questions? Yes, yes, hi. Thank you. Um, well, I had two. One was, it seemed initially when you talked about the immigration, I mean, it seems like a relatively large number. Yes. That's what they were focused on. Yes. Where did the bulk of that immigration go? I mean, maybe okay. 27 so yeah. So um, the question, the question, in, in case not everybody heard it, the question is about the those who emigrated. So I mentioned in the beginning that almost it seems like almost twenty seven thousand uh, Jews managed to emigrate. Um, that is actually a it's a small number. Com no, it, it's it's yes, it's 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 a large number, but it's a small number comparatively. So in my research that I do on uh, Nazi Vienna, um, and there's a, a lot of information about that in the book, that over a hundred thousand Jews fled from Vienna in between March of 1939, March of 1938, excuse me, and. Um, pretty much in that first year, but up through to October 1941, almost 100,000. Um, and the Czech, the Czech Jews are following after that, are modeled after that system. So where did they go? I want to say that they went anywhere that they could go. The only difference is that um, when Jews were emigrating earlier from Vienna, they might have fled to Poland. Right? They might have fled to Poland. That might have been one of the places that they emigrated to. Um, nobody is going to go there after the war starts. And similar with other, with other countries. But a lot of people went to France. A lot of people went to the United States. Some people went to Shanghai. Uh, the United States did not accept that many. No, and that, that's part of a whole other problem. And um, sh sure, yes, they did not accept that many. But if you had somebody who could sponsor you, and you had the right timing, you could do it. Are there any other questions right now? Maybe come, can I come back to you? <coughs> Just because I don't know what my time frame. Oh. OK. Hi, Marsha. Hi. I, I, to follow up with the, with the rabbi's question, I know that what you, you're reporting from your interaction with the family is they're not familiar with the details of his relationship with the Mueller's. But did they give you uh, a, a, uh, an idea of uh, the, Mr. Flume's personality, what his values were, uh, his religious background, his family influence, and what would make him uh, to, to risk his life and that of his families as well mm -hmm. to save all these um, family heirlooms for mm -hmm. another family? Yes. Um, so that is a fantastic question. I, I'm so glad it's on the videotape so I can record all of your questions <laughs> so that I can write them down so that I can do, <laughs> pursue each one of them. Um, because those are good questions. So what we had was a really a preliminary meeting I'm at the, like, just the tip of the, this research, at the beginning of this research. Um, I met with them. I can tell that they are a uh, down-to-earth kind of, um, um, they live in, like, in moderation. Um, I don't know that much, but as far as the type of man that he was, it seems like he was the patriarch of the family and somebody that was respected by all of them. They wanted to meet with us. They wanted to talk about it. The, um, <clears throat> the mother more than the son. I don't know. They had done research for us before we got there about, our, about the Mueller family. And uh, the, she insisted on taking us to the cemetery and pointing out all the Mueller graves. 
Um, so they had, so it, it, it seems to me that, that they are the descendants of a, of, of, that they're still carrying on his message. That's what it seems like to me. Like they're not, again, they didn't shut the door and say, we don't want to talk about what he did, you know, we, that awful grandfather who almost had us all, you know, killed. It seems like maybe it's something that's not talked about that much, but it's known. And they had a book, these, these pictures again, um, these pictures are from a book that they had made like in his honor, like a nice little um, sort of, you know, like we give now to our friends. I don't know a lot about their, their religious background. Um, I do, I can say, I mean, part of it has to do as well, which I mentioned, um, is what he had at his disposal. So does it make a difference, the fact that he's a gardener and he has this space? Um, that he might have potentially been able to dig things into the ground without getting caught. Um, did that make a difference? So the pe our people's actions are sometimes dependent on what they have, their ability to, do they have space to hide somebody, right? Do they have extra food to give? Or, um, you know, these kinds of actions are also dependent upon like his professions. I think that tells us a little bit of something. Uh, this is an interesting, picture here, though, I don't know if anybody noticed the building, the exact of the, of the building. So it's the same building. This is the recent picture of their home. And uh, that's the old picture. And you can see the same building right there. So they're, you know, they're still on this same piece of property. Um, it seems to me like there's a lot more of a story that I'm getting ready to unravel. <clears throat> With all the unrest in Europe regarding the Jewish population, I wonder if the townspeople are happy there are no Jews left, mm -hmm. or um, would they how they would feel about right. exactly. publicizing the Fluma family for for doing this? Exactly, which is which is exactly what I am not um, going to like. I don't want to put their pictures up necessarily. Um, it's very sad that that's the situation, but I don't know exactly how they would feel about you know, this being advertised, about his face being in a book. I, I don't know about that yet, and it's sad, but that t change, um, the, the, the change of the course in the way that Europe is going now, and the fact that, yes, there are these memorials and uh, places of memory for, for Jews, but there are a lot of places there are no Jews and a lot of places they don't want there to be any Jews or any memory of them. So I don't know yet if in this particular town if this would be a great story or not so great story. I know that I can tell from his daughter, obviously that you know that next generation or the next generation is always a bit different and she was excited about it, right? But bringing this information back home to a small town, we don't know exactly <clears throat> how it would be interpreted. But I can say that the, the Jewish community from Brno, the large, but next largest city, they're the one who do the upkeep for the, for the cemetery and the synagogue and all these things. Um, and it's all taken care of pretty nicely. So, uh, yeah, we can hope. Yes. There, in that, uh, in that area. area. Um, that's a very, good, another very good question. I do not know exactly if it, I'm sure that it is taught in general and some sort of general, it's mentioned in history, but I don't know exactly how, how uh, what their system is like. So that would be something interesting to look into, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Okay, should I take the one last one? You can ask me afterward. Okay, so so um, I would like to thank everyone very, very much for coming and for your attention and all of this wonderful uh, gathering. Um, I'm going to be out there. If you want to come and look at my book, please come look at it. If you want me to sign one for you, you want to buy one, I'm happy to do that as well.